Alchem has spent decades perfecting the art of microencapsulation for both the human and animal nutrition segments. Add in food processing and nutrition expertise, and we have the complete package you need to overcome the formulation or production challenges that hinder innovation. Look to PetSure from Balchem to provide the expertise and capabilities that redefine entire product categories and help bring your imagined products to reality. Hello everyone and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Kim Jones, part of the marketing team at Balchem. Today, we welcome Samuel Kipritich of Kansas State University and special guest, Dr. Greg Aldrich. They'll discuss research and details on how to keep raw meat-based diets safe for our companion animals. Samuel is a PhD candidate in the Department of Grain Science and Industry at Kansas State University. His research focuses on the use of non-thermal technologies and food additives to control foodborne pathogens in semi-moist and raw meat-based diets for companion animals. He earned a bachelor's degree in food science and technology from Makere University in Uganda and a master's degree in food science and technology with a focus in food safety and microbiology from Iowa State University. He has presented at annual meetings for the American Feed Industry Association, International Association for Food Protection, Arkansas Association for Food Protection, and Pet Food Forum. He is joined this morning by Dr. Greg Aldrich, who has been a guest on the webinar series several times. Dr. Aldrich has supervised 22 masters and PhD students, postdoctoral students, and researchers. He has also authored multiple book chapters, peer-reviewed manuscripts, presentations, and proceedings. He is a member of the American Society of Animal Science, the American Society for Nutrition, and the American Academy of Veterinary Nutrition. Greg writes a monthly column for the Pet Food Industry Magazine and has received Corbin Companion Animal Biology Award in 2019 from the American Society of Animal Science. Dr. Aldrich is currently Chief Operating Officer for New Low Pet Foods and an Associate Professor at Kansas State University. Gentlemen, the floor is now yours. Good morning and thank you. Can you hear me okay? Please give me a sign. Yes, we can. All right, thanks, Cam. Appreciate it. So, uh, by way of beginning this uh, webinar conversation with Samuel, I wanted to give some introductory remarks. Uh, first off, a thank you to Balkem for sponsoring uh, both the webinar and for Samuel's research that he's going to present, some of which uh, here this morning. Uh, K State has a long history in doing research in the area of food safety, and more recently, we've added to that. Uh, level of food safety research with uh, explorations into pet food safety. Um, our pet food program uh, has been exploring the effects of processing on pet food as it regards nutrition, food safety, and shelf life since its inception in 2012. Our early work really focused on food safety regarding the kibble and how the influence of uh, food additives and other ingredients might influence kibble food safety. Uh, we've moved on from there to explore more in depth some of the ingredients that are used, especially those at the post-kill step, things like fats and flavors. Uh, we've published a number of papers in that area and have also moved on then into semi-moist pet foods and more recently, and the subject of this discussion this morning, begun the discussion or the exploration of how we can influence food safety for our raw meat-based diets. These are very popular food forms. Samuel's gonna share a little bit about where they are in regards to uh, popularity in the marketplace, but more importantly, how they uh, are affected by contamination with pathogens. Our collaborators on this work have been Valentina Trinetta, and Cal Ramos Silveru will be helping us as we finish out some of this work uh, that Samuel will allude to later. In addition to our friends here at Balkem, Dr. Eric Altum and Robert Mason, who've been uh, very important uh, collaborators in the work as well. The work that Samuel's going to introduce to you will serve as a platform for the rest of our discussion this morning. And uh, he's going to give you a few tidbits of or a teasers of some of the work that he's done in his PhD uh, research 
Uh, much of this has already been published, so hopefully you'll have an opportunity to uh, write down those references. And with that, I'll hand it over to Samuel. Uh, by the way, this is a prelude to his defense that will be scheduled here next month. So Samuel, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aldrich. Uh, can everybody hear me? We got you. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you for the inter introduction, um, Kim and Dr. Aldrich for this opportunity. And uh, how about we talk about uh, raw meat-based diets and why they're upon us and uh, why should we care about the safety? So uh, the brief uh, presentation that I'll be sharing uh, this morning is just a synopsis uh, of some of the work that we have published. Uh, so we, we wrote uh, last year a review paper where we were looking at food additives that could be used to control uh, pathogens in raw diet. So we're looking at things like bacteriophages, food acidulin, so looking at um, essential oils. We're looking at high pressure pasteurization and why we think it's not that effective and why we're trying to make a case as to why we need to do more work. And out of uh, our review paper, we did some work. Uh, Balkan was uh, gracious enough to sponsor it. And so we were looking at how we could apply encapsulated and dry-plated acidulins to control salmonella in these diets. And so this has been published and this set the stage for the, for the studies that we're doing and for some of the studies I'll talk about in my last slide. And so what are raw meat based diets? So raw meat based diets are segment of minimally processed uh, pet foods different from conventional diets. So we're talking about conventional diets like kibble, uh, the canned pet food and uh, the mainstream stuff uh, we get at the grocery store. And so uh, the argument here is that raw meat based diets are basically uh, a segment of minimally processed pet foods. And so out of the minimally processed pet foods, we have minimally processed commercial diets that can be sold at the grocery stores and other and minimally processed home diets. So that goes for the people that make their own diets in their home, homes. And so these diets mainly con con uh, consist of uncooked and pasteurized animal protein, things like beef, veal, venison. And in, uh, in 2021, the market share for the minimally processed diet was 120 million dollars. But we believe that the segment uh, that the actual value for this raw meat diet uh, is around something like $33 million. But again, we're hoping Nielsen has better data soon for that. And so what makes this diet unique? Um, so AFCO uh, defines uh, raw diets as a feed or feed ingredients derived from animals, uh, but all these things, uh, all these ingredients have to be in the unprocessed state. So raw diets cannot be frozen, they can't be cooked, we can't render them, we can't ferment them hydrolyze them or purify them. And so once these options are taken out, then we really do not have a true kill step for decontaminating this diet because cooking or extrusion or rendering would help us eliminate majority of the pathogens that we would be I would be concerned about. And then the other situation is that the ingredients used to making RMBDs uh, inherently contain uh, pathogens. Like for instance, uh, chicken is uh, sal uh, notorious for salmonella and campylobacter. Uh, pork can have some salmonella, beef uh, might have E. coli. And so depending on the cleanliness of the ingredients we're getting in, that's going to determine the quality of our diet. And so currently the pasteurization techniques are wrong, uh, high pressure pasteurization and irradiation, but there's some issues about that. And so let's look at the contamination of this diet. Um, so pathogens like salmonella, campylobacter, E. coli have been isolated from these diets in the past. And then the diets also at least have been linked to foodborne disease outbreaks. Uh, they've been implicated in the transmission of multi-drug resistant uh, strains of bacteria. Uh, those are what we could call uh, uh, superbugs, the, 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 uh, the bacteria resistant to antibiotics. And then the product recalls uh, by the FDA have also been uh, a key challenge because there have been over 80 uh, recalls as of now. And so why should we care about this diet? Because again, why are we having this conversation today? So assuming, uh, this is an excerpt from Lambertini et al. So assuming uh, we go to the grocery store and um, we get to the grocery store and then we buy some bread food, but it's a raw diet, but then it contains some salmonella. Uh, usually these diets are refrigerated or frozen, and then we're gonna have to handle the food and then give uh, the pets the food. And then as adults, we interact with the uh, you know food preparation equipment in the house and then touch our household surfaces, touch our phones, touch our kitchen counters, and then families that have children or uh, immunocompromised people, then this becomes a 
suddenly a huge uh, threat. And then, for instance, if this family uh, prepared maybe food for potluck and then had uh, had, had had salmonella contaminate their food uh, preparing equipment and surfaces, they could it could cause um, an entire outbreak. So those are the, those are some of the reasons that inspire me to do this kind of work because again. We have an issue, we have a problem, and I think we have a great opportunity to find to start finding some solutions and answers. And so let's look at the prevalence again. So this was a study by the FDA from 2010 to 2012. And um, the FDA tested 196 samples of raw pet food, dry pet food, jerky, semi-moist pet food. And if we look at uh, what they found out, we can see that almost um, the raw pet food um, had 32 uh, samples positive for listeria, which is a huge problem, and almost 15 for salmonella, and the rest uh, of the foods uh, were, were relatively safer. And so this further justifies uh, our argument as to why we need to invest some more time into this kind of research. And then let's look at the recall. So this is from 2020, uh, uh, February to March 2022. And again, we can see that 67% of the raw diet uh, uh, raw diets contribute um, around 67% of all the recalls in the different segments of pet food, like treats, dried up food, cuts, uh, cut food and semi-moist pet treats. So again, some manufacturers are hurting. It's hindered. Uh, I mean, I don't think that they would really be, <laughs> they're having such numbers and having such massive issues with contamination. Must be a huge financial issue. And so let's look at the nature of our challenge. Uh, what What is unique uh, about raw meat based diets? And uh, so our problem here is one, we have variable contamination across, uh, variable contamination for the raw materials. So each batch of chicken, each batch of turkey, each batch of liver, each batch of carrots is going to show up with different levels of bacteria, it being pathogenic or just spoiled microorganisms. So, that means the process is almost variable every time we do the work. And then there's no thermal processing. So we're not going to cook this or we're not going to cook our products. Then we're combining meats and vegetables and additives. And um, we're looking at things like cold transportation uh, shortfalls. Uh, packaging, is the packaging inadequate? Are we doing enough with the current packaging? Should we maybe explore modified atmospheric packaging or controlled atmospheric packaging? Um, how effective our, our antimicrobial interventions or the kill steps we're trying to apply. So it's like we have all these questions and we need to answer these questions so that we can actually go mainstream with this kind of diet. And so let's uh, one of our studies, uh, we used uh, organic acids uh, to pasteurize from it with diets. And so here in the study, this is the study that I shared. Uh, I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, we used uh, GDL, uh, citric acid, uh, and lactic acid. And uh, these acids, at least, were known that uh, they have some antimicrobial properties and they're widely used in the uh, in the meat industry uh, to control for, um, again, salmonella and other pathogens. And so we thought that this would be a great opportunity uh, to see if we can extend over this technology to the raw side of pet food. But then the problem is, addition of direct acid to has uh, uh, causes undesirable changes in product. So like our preliminary work has shared differences in color, texture, in oasis, we've seen some oxidation. And so uh, this is where the, the, the genius part of Balkan comes and it's the encapsulation technology where they get this organic acids and coat them with edible uh, uh, vegetable oil. And so the encapsulation allows for slow release of acid into the product. So we don't have acid shock and we don't have undesirable effects of uh, the acidification uh, being caused by addition of these acids. So basically, we're just trying to reduce the acid shock and then release the acid into the meat matrix over time so that we don't cause radical changes in the texture and color and of the product. And so let's just briefly talk about the mechanism of action. How do organic acids generally uh, kill bacteria. So basically, what we're looking at here is, uh, so an organic acid is a weak acid. It does not fully dissociate in solution. So hydrochloric acid would be like hydrogen and chlorine fully dissociated, but this is not fully dissociated. And so at some point, this acid gets into the cytoplasm of this bacteria, and then it dissociates. Now, when it dissociates, this proton that uh, 
that produces interfere with this ATP process, and so the bacteria cell cannot create its own energy. If it can't create its own energy, then it can't run its own metabolic machinery. If it can't run that, then you can't have protein synthesis, and the cell dies at that point. And so let's look at some of the results that we found uh, in our previous finding, which was uh, a microbial challenge uh, study. So what we did here is we produced um, we produced uh, 20 diets. And out of these 20 diets, we treated them with different types of acid. Uh, so we had three different, uh, so we had, we had three different uh, major types of acid. So for instance, we had, here we have an encapsulated citric acid, and then we have the raw or the dry plated uh, citric acid. Same again, for the, uh, we have the encapsulated lactic acid, and then we have the raw, uh, lactic acid but again at three percent and then at two percent and at one percent and we also had gdl2 which is gluconod delta lactam um, so for each acid we had three levels uh, and then we had the encapsulated acid and then we had the raw acid and then we had a positive control now a positive control here we inoculated so we produced all the styles and then treated them with this different uh, levels of acetylant and then inoculated all of them with salmonella to up to like a million cells or a six log. So if you look at this, this is the positive control. So the positive control was not treated with any acid at all because we wanted to see how much salmonella can die or how what's the survival rate of salmonella in a diet uh, that does not contain the acetylene. And so this is the log reduction. And to calculate the log reduction, you're calculating the initial number of uh, salmonella that you put in the diet and then the diet contains the the diet contains the, the antimicrobial action, and then you keep monitoring them over day. So this study was done for 22 days, and so after every three days, we did microbial analysis to see how much pathogens uh, we had, and so the total load reduction is after 22 path, after 22 days. Well, how many pathogens uh, are we left with? So that's the log reduction. So a low log reduction is undesirable. The higher the log reduction the better uh, the result we're looking for. And so here we only had maybe around uh, a very small reduction, a one log reduction is around two, one, this is 1.3, it's around like, uh, it's a, uh, uh, this is a low number here. But then once we start using our CG lens, uh, before I even continue, let me just, uh, so this uh, graph is blocked into different quadrants because these are different, uh, this is 2%, 3%, this is 1%. So we're trying to see uh, how these uh, these acids perform within a similar group at a similar concentration. And so GDL gave us almost a two log reduction, but that was not impressive. And then encapsulated lactic acid at 1% gave us a good number. We were looking at this with three log reduction. So we can see this was significant compared to all these other graphs. Uh, citric acid and uh, citric acid, the encapsulated and the raw acid, do not have much difference between the log reductions uh, with the lactic acid. So that's something we noticed, uh, the strength was almost equal, but the encapsulated lactic acid performed just a little bit better. And then GDL, so GDL, again, we did not see any much improvement in the log reduction because again, even when increased the percentage to 2%, we don't see much difference. But then what happens here is for the raw uh, acid, we start seeing differences. The numbers completely shift compared to when it's at 1%. So we almost have here a four point something log reduction at two percent compared to the encapsulated counterparts. These are encapsulated, encapsulated, but then here the raw acids are uh, performed better. And then things get dramatic when we increase the concentration to three percent again. At three percent, we can see we almost have a six log reduction, oh, and yet uh, that's the initial number of organisms we almost had. And then if you look at the encapsulated at three percent, if you look at the uh, at the encapsulated acids at high concentrations, uh, things don't change much. But the exciting part of our study was we being able to get a three log reduction uh, uh, at, uh, with a 1% encapsulated acid because then that would help us build uh, the next uh, level of our studies. And so just to show you some pictures from the study to understand the difference between the raw acid and the uh, and the, uh, the raw acid and uh, the encapsulated acetylene. So this is 1% lactic acid, which is encapsulated on day one after 24 hours of production. 
and you look at how the meat looks nice and red. And this this is the dry, uh, this is the raw acid after 24 hours. So these acids are produced at the same, uh, these diets are produced at the same time, but after 24 hours, the discoloration is extremely severe in the one that is produced with the raw acid. So again, it makes the encapsulated acid better. Then we saw some interesting studies. Uh, so if you look at, uh, at this graph here, uh, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go through the details to talk about what we're seeing here, but this is the interesting part down here. So this is 3%, uh, this is 3% citric acid on day 13. On day 13, we had zero salmonella. All the salmonella had died, but then we started to, we started to see some more growth, especially as we increased uh, the concentration of the raw acid. So again, and yet, uh, uh, the, uh, encapsulated, uh, citra, the, enca uh, the encapsulated citric acid at 3% completely looked different, looked nice, and the log reductions are still decent. And so this is what we're trying to deal with. This is the, this is the compromise we're trying to find at this point in our study is how strong do we need our CGNs to be? How can we blend them? How can we avoid a situation like this where we lose, we kill the pathogen, we kill the pathogen of interest, which is salmonella, but then we have something else growing, something that we have no control over. So before you leave that, go back to that slide, Samuel. So let's let's make sure we understand what's happened here. You had uh, a, a complete knockdown of the salmonella by day 13 with the raw acid, but we have something else that's a negative that's occurred here, right? What What's happening here from a microbial standpoint, do you think? Okay, so what happens is... Um, so when we uh, when we add in the direct acid, we start seeing uh, we see things like cinerosis or weeping. So uh, the moisture the moisture within the meat matrix uh, leaves the matrix. So basically, it reduces the water activity of the entire chunk of chicken or the entire kind of meat, and then that changes the ecological uh, the microecological environment, allowing for uh, opportunistic organisms like this. Looks like a like a very aggressive um, spoilage fungi that grows under very low uh, pH. Because at this point, the pH had dropped of, uh, up to something of uh, two to two or three, uh, two or three. So that's, that's all we're looking at. Okay, so we've, we've really changed the microbial ecology of this meat and vegetable matrix. And so on one hand, we've done what we wanted with the control of salmonella, but we perturbed the system and uh, created a new opportunity for other organisms. And these may not be toxic per se to humans or pets, but they certainly are spoilage and would cause us to discard the product. Um, yeah. So that's kind of interesting. So in essence, what we're trying to find here, if I can paraphrase, is that sweet spot somewhere between uh, a sufficient level of control of those pathogens without changing the system and allowing other microorganisms to get a foothold. Um, when you go back to the previous slide in that sweet spot, is, is that at three log? Is that at five log? Where, where do we want to be? Where's, where's ideal in this situation, do you think? So, uh, Dr. Aldrich, thank you for asking that. Uh, the FDA would at least want us to at least have a five log reduction or uh, if, for instance, a five log reduction would be uh, in non-microbiological terms, if you have an initial population of one million uh, cells, uh, a five log, uh, five log reduction at least would that you need to knock down almost, that's like 90.99% uh, of all those organisms. Yeah. So that's what, that's, that's what the FDA wants us. The FDA wants us at five log. But the challenge right. is once uh, our treatments are to get to five log, we have to use extremely aggressive treatments. And then when we use 3%, yes, it gives us a six log reduction, absolutely wonderful, but then the product looks like this, so it's uh, unpalatable. Right, so what you're, what you're suggesting here is that, that these acidulants, whether they're encapsulated or they're dry plated or raw, they're effective, but they may be uh, in that affected range, they may be causing some other negatives. So um, in essence, we've got to add something to them. Is that what you're kind of trying to suggest here? 
Yes, because so we could we could use all the amount of acidity that we want, and we would up, we would we would sterilize our food. But the problem yeah. is it, it will be unpalatable. So we're trying to find uh, that spot where we can use the acid, but then combine it with other with uh, other stresses. So we're, we're looking at refrigeration, freezing, and then we okay. use the acidulant. And so, we, that, and that's the approach uh, to the hardware technology that I was about to talk about. But so that's, that what you're, be- that's where you were headed next, and that is the introduction of the idea. It's an old old concept in microbiology, food safety is this, this hurdle technology. So go ahead with that. I, I, I'm sorry to have interrupted you, but this, I think, helps reinforce where we're headed. Yes. And so basically what we're saying is if you look at uh, this graphic cartoon here, if we just use uh, low water activity, a low water activity food would be like kibble. Then that means we'd have to extremely dry our product. But then what if you want some moisture in your product? For instance, it's a raw diet. We want moisture in it. So what can we do about it? How can we manipulate the water activity so that we can reduce it a little bit? Maybe adding some salt, maybe adding some acid. Then let's look at modified atmospheric packaging. Something like what if we produce our raw diets, treat them with acidulants, but then flush them with nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Or we're trying to throw away their chemistry. What we're trying to do here is just stress this bacteria from multiple angles so that they do not thrive, so that they do not grow and multiply. So if if your product comes in with only 10 cells of salmonella, we want to make the conditions so terrible that they do not grow to 1 million. And so by creating multiple hurdles along their way within their survival, we constrict them that way. And that way we don't damage the product. For instance, if you look at summer sausage, fermentation, fermentation is great. Uh, we produce lactic acid, but, uh, lactic acid, which reduces the pathogens, uh, which uh, makes uh, lowers the pH of the product. And then the bacteria themselves too are able to outcompete other organisms. And then at that point, if we change the air mixture, then lactic acid bacteria then outcompetes our pathogens. And so we're looking for soft ways, soft ways, soft ways to control these pathogens because again, this is a mini molecular diet. Okay. And so right now, uh, the kind, uh, the ongoing and the future research uh, that we're doing in our lab right now. So uh, the, uh, the studies that we're carrying out right now, the first one is evaluation of synergies from combinations of food acidulants. So uh, after the study that we just saw, we saw that the citric acids, the dry plated and the encapsulated acids, uh, we thought that maybe if we start combining them, then we would not need to use a very, uh, would, would, then we would use a um, lower dose of each acid so that we take advantage of their different uh, mechanisms of action. And so again, we're just still creating additional hurdles, additional hurdles while lowering the dose of their acidulants. And then the next part we're trying to do is predictive modeling. So uh, we're trying to evolve from the spots where we have to go to the lab and do the analysis. We're trying to do models. We're trying to build models that can help us predict. For instance, if we treat uh, a raw diet maybe with a combination of citric acid and lactic acid at this concentration, and then this kind of pathogen or this number of pathogens show up in our product, we should be able to run our model so that we can predict um, our safe zones. So that's the next step we're going so that it's easy. If we build the models and validate the models, then many companies can easily adopt uh, this technology and uh, and basically make products with much ease with lesser microbial. And then we'll also need to do shelf life studies and product quality studies. So here, we're just trying to understand uh, things like total plate counts. What's the number of microorganisms in there? What's the number of total coliforms in there? What's the level of contamination? How dirty were our ingredients? What should we be concerned about? And then we also need to do some palatability studies because again, we want our dogs to uh, like our diets. Then the next time after we're done with this, uh, so future studies will be looking at, again, using acidulants to control um, pathogens and freeze uh, dried uh, pet food. Because uh, we're thinking uh, if we can use acidulants uh, to eliminate high pressure pasteurization, and then we could lower the cost of producing freeze-dried diets such that more people purchase these diets. But 
the challenge of trying to treat them using high pressure pasteurization just complicates a lot of issues and we're trying to see if we can bypass that at this point. Otherwise, this is it and thank you. I'll take your questions. I want to come back around here, Samuel, and, and make sure we reinforce a couple of critical or key points in this research. One is that uh, part of what you've evaluated here is the dosage of the acidulants, and you had three acidulants, and it seemed like, from my perspective, lactic acid performed the best. And the second was that we were evaluating encapsulated versus raw. And yes. the, across the board, the encapsulated seemed to give us a slightly muted or blunted impact relative to the raw acid, but yet it gave us a reasonable response, uh, especially at a, at a level that might be commonly used as a food additive at 1%. We're, getting, we're not getting five log, but we're getting three log reduction with an encapsulated lactic acid at 1%, and uh, that is also allowing the product quality or visual aspects of the product to be maintained. And so I think our walk away from some of this work was is that 1% uh, looks like a, sort of the sweet spot if we can take the lactic acid that's encapsulated with this time release delivery of the lactic acid and the preservation of the products, color and texture. If we can do that at 1% and maybe by adding other uh, acidulants or other process steps, get to that five log. Is that kind of what you're proposing here is with your next steps is to add some things to the encapsulated lactic acid? Yes, yes. So the, the goal is if we can get a three log reduction and then we only have an extra two log to get to five log. So what are the factors? Can we, can we, what other things can we do to help push us there? Because then a three log, a 1% lactic acid, we're not damaging our product. Our product looks great. It's nice. There's no synergies. So what can help push us over the edge? So those are the small technologies. Those are the small innovations that I think we should focus on to push us over the edge. Okay. So part of your results here, you were looking at this time course over 22 days for a raw meat-based diet. Was the, under your experimental conditions, were those held in refrigeration or in uh, incubator? Uh, so uh, all the diets were held uh, under refrigeration at 40 degrees uh, Celsius. Yeah, so they would represent, 22 days would represent the time for manufacturing through, in a commercial setting, through uh the distribution to retail and so the the assumption would be that the customer would see that product at somewhere around day 18 or so is that kind of what you're guessing so they would have about four days of of that last kind of tail end of the time course on this when it would be offered to their pet is is that what you're trying to suggest so uh I think uh, that would uh, that would that, that would still be risky because again we also we also trying to fight against uh, spoilage uh, microorganisms and spoilage microorganisms. For instance, uh, you see uh, the slimy stuff when chicken is going bad. That slimy that sliminess. The pathogens. So go, to that, that go, to that next, go to that next slide where you get the time course for me. Yeah, the next one. one, right? There you go. Yeah. So this is this is what's happening over time, right? Yes. These are the same, roughly the same treatments, only this is just a 3% level. But you can see over time, you're getting out there around 16 to 19 days. That's when it's starting to plateau in regards to the log reduction. That would be, that would be concurrent with where the product would probably be merchandised after it's been manufactured. Yes, uh, but Dr. Ulrich, the other part also is to combine other things. For instance, if we produce the diets and then freeze them rapidly, yeah, uh, maybe rapidly freeze them, treat them with acetylene and freeze them rapidly, um, that yeah, chilling but it is, it should be able to, to even bring us back uh, closer to reduce the nut, would keep us safer. But for this, so the, the way I designed this experiment, this was like worst case scenario for the diets. 
Yep. Right. But if I freeze it, then I'm no longer raw, correct? Well, that's another war to fight with the FDA again. With the yeah. Out. So, so I think you know if we're freezing, that's another product type. You know, there's there's frozen diets in the marketplace, and there, yeah. and that's also a preamble to the freeze dried products in their market. That's kind of where we're headed next. Yeah, but under the circumstances of these raw meat based diets, it's a big challenge, right? And so, um, yeah. combining with other technologies is going to be absolutely essential. But it looks like the one percent in encapsulated was sort of the closest thing we got to a sweet spot: three log reduction, yes. uh, retention of the product color, texture. Uh, it maintained its its water, so we didn't have centeresis. Yeah. And uh, we we got a good control over the uh, the salmonella at least in an in an inoculation model. Yeah. So let's go let's go to your final slide there with your five steps. And so we will just kind of hold out here for a minute. I've got a couple more questions, and I'm going to turn it over to the audience and see if there's some questions coming in to Kim at the moment. Um, so let's see here. I had a couple written down. Um, and uh, one of the things that you were kind of uh, addressing and you weren't very uh, you weren't very friendly to is this uh, high pressure pasteurization. And uh, that seems to be the state of the art today for raw meat based diets and even in the preparation steps for freeze drying. Why do you feel that the HPP is insufficient, not, not negative, but insufficient for long-term control or maybe even just economics? Uh, is, is that where you're, where, where you're coming with that well, uh, well, approach? Uh, well, Dr. Aldrich, I'll first of all have to admit that I'm a little bit biased. Okay, but well, let's be diplomatic and you're a scientist, so you have to be able to, to tell us yes. what the, the yes. pros and cons. So what's, what are so some of the shortcomings for the raw meat, for the for the HPP? So HPP is extremely effective if you are trying to pasteurize a whole chunk of meat, because then you're only dealing with the pathogens, that are not pathogens, or you're just dealing with the microorganisms that are on the surface of the meat. But and so that that is that's absolutely possible. Getting a five log reduction on a huge chunk of uh, meat is not a big problem with HPP. But our challenge with our raw diets is after we have to grind and comminute everything into smaller pieces so that you can incorporate the vegetables and the fruits within the entire matrix of the product. And so that's where the problem comes in because then by, by grinding them down, grinding down the whole chunks of meat, we increase our surface area of, uh, for microbial attachment. And then we also redistribute the pathogens within the entire food matrix. So the pathogens that were just on the surface of the meat now are inside the matrix and have extra protection from the meat. So it becomes a big challenge um, to use HP in that position. That's, yeah. That is the shortcoming of HP in my own opinion. Okay. So in ground meats and ground product, we're, we do have a lot more surface area and you have a lot more potential for con cross-contamination there. Um, that I think the folks in the HPP business would suggest to us that they're they've demonstrated it's effective. Um, one of the things I guess I was curious about here from your research would be whether or not uh, one percent lactic acid in combination with an HPP process might might actually potentiate both. That you would get some synergy from the combined. Uh, use of those technologies, that, that hurdle technology you were talking about. Yes, uh, absolutely, Dr. Aldrich. Uh, we would see a massive potentiation effect. There, there's been studies that have showed uh, every time we have combined uh, acetylens, uh, the acetylens uh, with HEP, we have seen uh, some decent results. So I think that should be another potential uh, point where we can evaluate uh, going to the future because then combinations of HEP and uh, if we can find a way to reduce the, H, uh, the cost of HPP and then combining it with an acetylant even makes it easier. Okay. So I'm going to turn this back over to Kim and see if there's some questions that have come in from the audience and uh, make sure that we're sharing with everybody that might be interested in the topic. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Samuel and Greg. Uh, but before we get started answering some of the questions, we'll share a brief video, and then we'll be right back to answer all the questions that were submitted during today's webinar. Trim meat and plant-based proteins can be processed to look and work more like whole muscle cuts. Here we will show you how the PetSure structuring and forming technologies work. In this example, we have taken chunked trim meat and restructured it into this finished whole muscle-like chub. As you can see, it resembles a whole muscle cut that with PetSure's restructuring and forming technology can be further processed like any other whole muscle cut. This is a cost-effective way to transform trim meat into high-value, nutritious, solid meat products while improving production efficiency. This is just one in a series of videos highlighting product usage examples and new ideas. Visit the PetSure webpage to see more ways to turn your imagination into reality. Now, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Gentlemen, your first question is from Sarah. Are food acidulants used widely in the human food industry? I'm thinking about fresh fruits and veggies that get recalled for contamination. Uh, thank you, Sarah, uh, for the question. Yes, uh, so this, uh, the acid blends, uh, for instance, the acidulants, the organic acids that we use in vegetables, we use them as sanitizers to clean off the pathogens. Uh, maybe it's like a rinse. Uh, you use, uh, you create an, an acid solution, then you rinse your product before you put it on the shelf, stuff like that. Excellent. Um, Han has a question also. Why did you arrive at trying lactic acid and not, for example, propionate? propionate. Let me take that one, Samuel. You know, we've, we've evaluated acetate, propionate, butyrate, short-chain fatty acids, medium-chain fatty acids. There's a whole litany. What we were trying to do in all of this research in the past uh, five, seven, eight, ten years is to work with uh, food additives that are currently grass status and that we have a background and understanding of their palatability or preference for the animal. Uh, we know that propionic acid is effective under certain circumstances, mostly as a mold inhibitor, more so than as a bacterial or pathogen control. And it has enough of a off taste or odor that it can be challenging from a palatability and, and intake standpoint. So Sam, you got any other thoughts on that topic or did I get it pretty well? No, I think you did a good job. <laughs> Thanks. The next question is kind of a follow-up to that. Um, Andrew is asking, can acids be used in combination with other technologies? Yes, they can. So, uh, so we could combine acids uh, with high pressure pasteurization. Um, we could combine um, acids uh, with freezing. So it's uh, it just it's about creating additional hurdles. Uh, for instance, we could combine refrigeration with lactic acid bacteria to you know the fermentation and all those things. It's just about creating hurdles that inconvenience the bacteria to a point where they do not grow and multiply on the overwhelm the product and then you get an outbreak or you get a massive product to go. So what we're trying to do is just throw everything at them to ensure that they don't grow and they don't, that's, that's what we're trying, essentially what we're trying to do. Excellent. Um, Julia is saying, great presentation. Do the results apply to freeze-dried raw pet food or would you expect differences between high versus low moisture raw pet foods? Um, of course, we would expect uh, a lot of significant uh, differences uh, uh, in the survival of these pathogens because, again, freeze-dried uh, products are extremely dry, low moisture. So if the salmonella in freeze-dried product, it's most likely dormant. But then in our situation with the raw diet, we have a high water activity of over 0.98. And so they're happier and they, eat, they, they survive easily in raw diets compared to freeze-dried. But again, 
Salmonella has been known to be extremely adaptive. It can survive under conditions of extremely low water activity, but they're dormant. And so when you rehydrate the product, they get that moisture and they're capable of growing back up and taking over the product. So again, we don't have the answers. We'll have to go to the lab and find those answers. That's part of Samuel's next steps, frankly, Julia. And uh, you know, he's, he's in that process of evaluating the best uh, experimental model to uh, determine the influence of both the freeze shock uh, and when we are supposed to or best uh, add the acidulants in their dose. Uh, because the free shock and the acidulant may have an impact on survival. Uh, we also know that we have to have a certain amount of moisture in the product to be able to, to, uh, to, to take the, uh, to destroy these pathogens. And so uh, once the product is dried, whether or not um, it is uh, growing or whether we're able to uh, kill those pathogens is, is one of those questions we're trying to answer. So. Uh, stay tuned, uh, Samuel probably will have that answer by about August. Yeah. Great. Um, Lindsay is asking, did you test TBA or any other rancidity markers during the 22 days? I'll take that uh, one, Samuel. Good question. Uh, I don't believe that we did any uh, shelf life evaluations on these uh, in regards to oxidation. We have done some previous with oils. Uh, a variety of oils, and that was uh, Dr. DeCall's uh, work, who was doing a postdoc in our laboratory. And by and large, we did not see a decline in the quality of the fats and oils as we added uh, various acidulants. So um, we, we do know that we'll see some increase in the free fatty acids at the beginning uh, if we use a high concentrations of the acids. But other than that, the primary and secondary oxidation products seem to be relatively stable. Excellent, okay. Um, next question is coming from uh, Ding. Can acid be claimed as a processing aid instead of an ingredient of the product? Well, that really comes down to you and your regulatory uh, professional in your organization and how you want to classify it as a processing aid. Um, it would be my expectation that you would want to include that on the label, especially if you're looking at somewhere around 1% or above. Uh, but one could make the argument um, that it's a processing aid. Okay. Um, Heather is asking, could acidulants behave differently in different types of meats, for example, beef versus chicken? Yes, because uh, again, the, the beef is a different muscle matrix compared to the chicken, so we would anticipate uh, some differences. But uh, in our studies, we decided to focus on poultry meat because again, poultry meat is cheaper as an ingredient compared to using maybe beef. But I think uh, we, we the difference is definitely. The, the one thing I could see that might be a big difference between beef and chicken is that beef's going to have a lot more color. And the changes that Samuel noted in the stenoresis and color at the higher pHs might be even more dramatic in beef products or even lamb. Next question comes from Ina. Have you done any testing on bacteriophages as a reduction method? What is your opinion on of this method? Uh, that's a good question. So we we summarized uh, some uh, some papers uh, in our review paper looking at how uh, how bacteriophages could be used to control uh, contamination, not in raw pet food but in ground poultry and ground beef because that's the existing research, and we were trying to see how effective that was in human food and whether we could transfer uh, back that technology to our side of robot food. But so far, uh, we really haven't gotten good answers because again, there's so many uh, fudges out there. And so we do not have a standardized way of testing what specific kind of fudge. Most companies that are dealing with fudges now have their own blends of fudges and they have their own challenges. But I would think that Bacteria fudges would be a good candidate for raw, uh, for raw diets. But again, there's just so much work that we need to do before we can we can come forward with the studies that we could use this as an, an antimicrobial intervention. Next question comes from Zach. 
how would the log reduction of pathogens change over time if you freeze the product at zero degrees, not freeze drying, right after adding the encapsulated lactic acid? Would it change anything compared to the refrigerated test? Yes. Uh, so uh, if we freeze the product, uh, that process of freezing also significantly lowers uh, the speed and the rate at which the, the bacteria multiplies. So that way, that temperature allows them, slows them down a little bit, so they don't grow that much compared to when you use refrigeration. So uh, the log differences may not be much, depending on how you freeze your product and how long you freeze it and how you inoculate it. But again, the bacteria that have been frozen are easier to kill because the process of freezing them gives them a chilling injury. So they are weaker and they're easy to knock out compared to bacteria that have just been living nicely at 37 degrees maybe Celsius. Uh, next question comes from Dawn. Is radiation exposure a potential in killing the pathogens? Absolutely, good question. Uh, irradiation, irradiation would be our best bet compared, looking at all the available technologies we have right now, uh, irradiation would be our best bet. But again, the challenge we have with the people that are uh, attracted to this kind of diet, the people that, you know, have distrust. When somebody hears radiation or when they see a Radura symbol on their food product, they, they only think it is radiation, not irradiation, which is completely healthy. And so irradiation would bail, all of, uh, would bail us out of our contamination issue. But again, I don't think whether the consumer is going to receive that well, given the clientele that uh, eat this kind of diets. But Dr. Alvich, you could talk about it. Yeah, let me, let me add another layer to that. And I think Samuel's got it right. There's a political uh, and, and a marketing concern here, but uh, we also know that one of the challenges with using a radiation to treat meat products, especially ground products like this, is that we need to understand what the dose or the contamination level is uh, to dial in the dose of a radiation, uh, whether it's electron beam or gamma radiation. The, the idea here is, is that if the dose is proportional to the contamination level, and the challenge we face with ground meats, especially those that would come into the pet food sector, is that we don't know what that level is. Is it, uh, is it one log ten, or, or three log or five log or nine log? And if it's a higher log, then we need to have a higher level of uh, radiation and they measure that in kilograys. And I think the number max for pet food is 50 k, uh, kg or kilograys. The challenge yes. is, that the higher level of those kilograys that you go to, the more energy you're putting into the product and the more likelihood that we're going to get some rearrangement of some of the, the, the fats and oils. And uh, you know, there's some concerns that those could be a negative from a health standpoint or even a shelf life standpoint. So irradiation is a really complicated question. It's one of those things that we think could be a great solution, but the politics and the market headwinds are probably not going to allow us to go down that path anytime soon. Okay. Um, next question comes from Stacy. Which is the most widely used acids in fresh pet foods? I don't know that we know which ones are being used. Um, I would tell you that it's probably lactic acid or um, there are some that are using acetic acid or vinegar derivatives that are providing some support. Um, we've seen some work and even we've done some in our own lab using um, sodium bisulfate. Um, it's a pretty strong acid in these tender meat kind of products. And Stacy has a little bit of a follow-up question here. Do different acids act differently upon different bacteria? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, the salmonella is the one we're most concerned with at this stage of the game, uh, the listeria and the E. coli. We've been doing some work with S-Tech uh, in wheat flowers, and uh, you know the behavior there is slightly different. So. It really comes down to whether or not we need a dissociation or we just need the pH lowering. Or in the case of SBS, we've identified that the mechanism of action may actually be through a desiccation more than um, the, the effect on the proton motive force of the, the bacterial cell wall. 
Okay. Um, here's a very interesting question coming from Mike. Hello, interesting presentation, but focused on controlling salmonella. In the UK, recent outbreaks have involved Mycobacterium bovis, TB, in mm -hmm. raw cat food, and STEC, E. coli, which resulted yeah. in a human fatality. We also have issues about Camelobacter in our raw chicken products. Question one, what are the realistic chances of getting a methodology that will kill serious pathogens in raw meat-based foods? So we'll start with that one, and then there's a question to follow up here. Yeah, I was reading Mike's question earlier, and uh, thanks for those uh, comments, Mike. In, in short, you know, the part of where we're headed there is, well, we'll call it, you know, one's politics in regards to whether or not we should be providing raw meat-based diets to pets in the first place. And I'll let the consumers and their veterinarians answer some of that on their own. But if we are putting those raw meat-based diets into the marketplace, I think we have to use just this kinds of approaches, multiple hurdles to try to maintain or contain, contain uh, any of the pathogens that might be a threat. Doesn't mean that we're going to stop them all. Um, and that's testimony to the human food chain. We're working very diligently across industry and academia to solve these challenges in the food chain, but recognizing that you know it's, it's a risk-based assessment. We have to understand that periodically one organism is gonna slip through and have an impact on a susceptible individual. Um, you know, that's, that goes clear back to some of the early work that we used to do not we, me, but the industry and academia in things like commercial sterilization of canned foods. And I think we feel pretty confident we've solved most of those, but recognize that it's still a statistical model for risk. And Dr. Aldrich, to, uh, to uh, give an, a different perspective uh, to Mike's question. Mike's question is great. He's saying, why do we could, why, why are we only focused on salmonella? But, why aren't you focused on Campylobacter or Mycobacterium? But the thing is, most of these bacteria belong to different, to the same family, they belong to the same genus. So for instance, uh, Enterobacteria Shea, which is, uh, Enterobacteria Shea, which is the, the family uh, of gram-negative bacteria. So you, you find things like Salmonella, Campylobacter, uh, E. coli, you find all of them grouped under enterobacteria share. So if I don't want to look for all those in the individual pathogens, I could test for enterobacteria share. And by testing on those, it can tell me what my relative risk is. Because if I'm seeing a high number of organisms that are associated with the family of salmonella or E. coli, and then I start, I start to get worried. And then we can also use things like indicator organisms. For instance, we don't have to look for steak E. coli per se. If I produce my diets, all I could test, I'll test it for maybe E. coli, generic E. coli, or coliforms. And that, by using indicator organisms, then I can start developing hypotheses at that point to, okay, then I'll start worrying. Or I'll look for gram positives. Then I'm like, okay, the stereo might be a problem here because this is a contamination pathogen. So if we can kill salmonella, because salmonella is extremely robust compared to other organisms. Then if we can kill salmonella, then we are pretty confident that we can take down uh, an organism like Campylobacter. And even at that same point, uh, we'll be able to kill Listeria. No, not Listeria, E. coli. For Listeria, Listeria is different. It belongs to a different family. It's a different type of pathogen. It takes more work, but there's certain organisms that if we can take out, then we can be pretty confident that we're doing good. I'll read the rest of Mike's question just for the audience to hear, but I think you've already kind of covered it. Question two says, also, should we bother when there is no scientific evidence that dogs or cats require meat to be fed raw? After all, we cook our foods. Why should we be allowed to increase risk for our pets and, and any in-contact animals, but especially vulnerable people who can contract these pathogens by just stroking a raw fed pet? Anything else to add there? No, I think Mike's captured the whole sentiment. Um, it is a concern, it, there is a risk, um, and it truly is not required of the animal's nutrition to be fed or raw food. Um, but those are things that if, if we're, from our perspective, if people are going to feed raw food, we wanna help make it as safe as possible. Yeah. yeah. And just as a kind of a final question to wrap us up here, um, Eric asks, 
and I, you've talked about this a little bit too, while feeding raw, fresh pet foods do contain risk and we recognize this fact. However, if we can manufacture these products safely, as you've outlined, would these products be considered more sustainable due to potential energy savings? That is a good question. Dr. Albert, what do you think? That's why we're thinking about this, <laughs> some of our work. Where, what's your perspective with that? So, you know, I, I think the use of food additives is going to have a pretty dramatic impact on energy utilization. And so I'm, I think that's why we're going down this pathway. Processing isn't going to get us out of all of our challenges. And uh, the, the delivery of food to our animals in a most energy and uh, zero carbon cost effective manner is the goal for a lot of consumers and uh, we'll be here to help with uh, their strategy along the way. Well, thank you, Greg and Samuel, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Dr. Aldrich, I know you do have a hard stop at the top of the hour, so I apologize that we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. But if you do have any additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balcom.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues on July 18th with the weaning transition in dairy calves. Why is it so traumatic? With Dr. Jim Drakeley from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for the Real Science Exchange or visit balchem.com tab slash podcast. If you want a cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll get that right off to you. On behalf of Balchem, Dr. Aldrich and Samuel, thank you for joining us today.